We're going to look today at the subject I chose to entitle, When Love Waits, and we're going to be seeing that in the event before us. We're going to be looking at, at a man by the name of Lazarus and uh, Jesus and what happens as Jesus raised him from the dead. That's what we'll be looking at here in uh, chapter 11. So let's begin reading in uh, John chapter 11 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 6 and we'll get into our study. John chapter 11 verse 1 and uh, reading to verse 6. John writes, A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And so as mentioned, I'm going to be sharing with you about the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and I chose to entitle it, When Love Waits. Now, this miracle, if you take notes, this miracle recorded here in John chapter 11 is the seventh miracle that is recorded in the Gospel of John. The first miracle that we saw, the first miracle recorded was in chapter 2 when Jesus made water into wine. When we got to chapter 4, we saw Jesus heal the nobleman's son. When we got to chapter 5, he healed a crippled man. In chapter 6, he fed 5,000. In chapter 6 also, he, he walked on water, and uh, in chapter 9, he healed a blind man. So this is the seventh miracle, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now, this isn't the only account in Scripture where Jesus Christ raises someone from the dead. When you look at your Bibles, you'll notice that in Luke chapter 7, there's a, a miracle of raising the dead when Jesus uh, raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead. That's found in Luke 7, 11 through 16. We also know in Mark chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, Jesus raised a, 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 a young girl, a, a, the daughter of a man by the name of Jairus. But this is a particular miracle that has uh, extreme, extremely, is extremely important. We'll see why in just a moment. And so as we do so, I'll begin again at verse 1 by reading and then beginning to comment. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, Jesus is in a city at this time, and we saw this in chapter 10 at verse uh, 40, basically. We knew that he was in an area that was called Beth, uh, uh, Bethabara. Um, Jesus is, is ministering now in a place, or moving on into a place where Lazarus is. And so we're being introduced right now to a man by the name of Lazarus, and we're being introduced in John's gospel to his sisters. He had two sisters, Martha and the other is, is Mary. Lazarus is only mentioned here. He'll also be mentioned later on in the 12th chapter. But Mary and Martha are mentioned in both chapters, as well as in Luke's gospel, and they're very well known in chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. We have a real story concerning uh, Martha being caught up with too much uh, concern and, and Mary choosing the better part. But you see them, and you see them uh, a few times in Scripture, and we see that Jesus loved them deeply. Now, when he speaks of this and he says that Jesus is in, is in um, he's uh, going to minister to Lazarus of Bethany, and it's mentioned as being the, uh, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, in verse 2, he, he wants to identify for us who this is. So he says, It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Interestingly enough, we don't see that event until chapter 12. But he's, he's speaking of that, and we'll look at that in detail when we get there. What has happened here is that uh, they have sent messengers to Jesus to notify him that Lazarus, their brother, is ill. That's what it says in verse 3 when it says, The sister sent to him. So messengers came, and this was the message. Lord, now notice how they say this. Behold, he whom you love is sick. And so they, they, they make mention of the fact that this is someone that Jesus loves very much. And, and if you have anything that you take out of just that one statement, let me encourage you with this. You know, when it says, 
that the one whom you love is sick, remember that he also is in love with you. I, I know I don't have to say that. I know every one of you know how deeply loved you are uh, by the Lord. But in fact, I think most of us sometimes wonder if he cares at all. So remember this. This is a, is a statement that's being made, this one you love very much. And this is a great place when you know that the Lord loves you, by the way. This is a great place to start when you take your petitions to him. You see, we need to realize that our need is beyond our strength. But we can have confidence in God's love for us. In Jeremiah 32, 17, it reads, O oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. And then he says, there is nothing too hard for you. We need to remember that. And these are people who were secure in the love of Jesus Christ. And the knowledge that he loved Lazarus and them gave them great hope and confidence. And so they bring that message. Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And so notice Jesus' reaction, verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So he had said something similar concerning the man born blind in chapter 9. Remember that the apostles had said, who did sin this man or his parents that he was born blind? And in John 9, 3, Jesus said this. He said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And so God's works are going to be revealed in what he's about to do in the raising of Lazarus. The question could be asked, so how could this situation produce glory to God and result in Jesus being glorified? Well, what's going to happen is this. It's going to result in Jesus' arrest and death, and that will bring glory to God. Because in chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, it says a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So this work that's going to occur is going to result in Jesus ultimately being arrested. And then after being arrested, we know that he's put on a cross and he's dying, and he dies. And this is what is going to ultimately bring glory to the Lord, to the Lord God, in that Jesus sacrifices his life, which we'll see as we continue through the Gospels. Now, in verse 5, it says, and this is interesting. I want you to note verse 3. Behold, he whom you love is sick. And then you see in verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So what does love do? It says in verse 6, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. He waited. He stayed. He didn't move. You would have thought that because he loves them that he would have left immediately to go be with them. Yet John tells us that Jesus stayed two more days in the place where he was. So the question is asked, why did he wait? Why the delay? And here's your answer. Because Lazarus must be unmistakably dead. And it takes time for somebody's death to settle in. And I'll show you a few things about that in just a moment. But it takes time for someone's death to settle in. There's normally a bit of shock, and, and um, God is very gracious to give us a place where we actually can almost be numb to the things. And it, and it takes time for death to settle in. And we'll see a little bit more in just a moment. Just wanted to touch that. Well, in verse 7 it says, After this he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now the dis disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? I know none of us would ever give advice to God. I know none of us would ever question what he says. We simply would agree, right? None of us. But I find it interesting uh, how human the Bible allows us to see the disciples. They were not superstars. They were not supermen of any sort. They were regular and ordinary human beings. And and so they think they can give God some advice. They think that they need to tell him what the situation is and, and all. Uh, it's because they're concerned that he's going to be killed. But his time has not yet arrived. And so he wants to make that very clear. And that's why in verse 9 he answers and says, Are there not 12 hours in the day? 
If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the, in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. And Jesus said to them plainly, Shut up, you guys, you bother me. He said, Lazarus is dead. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that Lazarus had died. And he also knew what he was soon to do. When he says Lazarus sleeps in verse 11, the men thought he was speaking in a literal sense. So they think, well, since he's sleeping, there's really no need to go back because that means he's going to get well soon. Because, you know, a lot of times when you haven't been well, you take a nap or sleep for a while, and you wake up refreshed, and that's they're taking him literally. So when he says, our, our friend Lazarus sleeps, I go that I may wake him up. That's why in verse 12 they said, if he sleeps, he'll get well. But in verse 13, Jesus spoke of his death. They thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. And that's why verse 14, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. He's aware of what he's about to do. And he's pleased because he'll strengthen their faith. He's going to die. They're going to, Lazarus died, but death will not have the final say. The point is, God will be glorified. Psalm 4610 is a beautiful psalm. You might want to mark this down. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. You know, one of the things that we need to remember is that faith is developed over time through experience. You have what is called head faith, and sometimes you have what is called said faith. But head faith and said faith doesn't save you and it doesn't give you peace. What you need to have is living faith. You need to have a faith that expects, that confidently rests in God, a faith that knows that my God is able no matter what. You need to have a faith that trusts God, a faith that says, God, I have my plans and I have my ideas, but Lord, you have yours and may your, may your plans overrule mine. May your, your desires be greater than mine. And Lord, help me not to ask for something you don't want me to have, because if you give it to me, I might think it'll give me pleasure. It may for a moment, but it isn't going to be a lasting one. So I need to rest in you and trust in you. Faith is a faith that expects God to move, but sometimes it's also a faith that's described as resting. We rest in the Lord and we trust him so that he might do what is right. I don't always understand. And yes, I've had many questions of the Lord. In, in John's gospel, God gave me a scripture a long time ago. We'll be seeing it when we, we are about to close. But it, it's when Jesus is having a conversation with, with the apostle Peter and begins to speak to him, and I'll paraphrase, he begins to say to him, you know, when you were young, you got up and went where you want. You dress yourself and go where you want to go. He said, but when you're older, you're going to be taken where you don't want to go. And this he spoke concerning the death that he would glorify God with. He was speaking of his martyrdom. But he's speaking to Peter, and he's speaking to Peter. He begins to speak directly to him, and he says, you know, you got up, you went where you wanted on your own will and your own timing and everything when you were young, but one day you're going to be taken where you don't want to go. He speaks of the way he's going to glorify God in his death. Now, what is Peter's response? Well, well, it says that he saw John, the one whom Jesus loved, standing over there, and he says, well, what about that man? Now, isn't that typical human? Okay, you just told me I'm going to die. Can he die too? I mean, that... What about him? And I'm one of those guys, you know, that I can return to this. I can return to this mentality. Now, wait a minute, Lord. What about that guy? And the answer Jesus gave to Peter is an answer he's given to me and maybe to somebody in this room right now. He says, what have you got to do with him? You follow me. Don't be worrying about how I work in somebody else's life. You be concerned about how I'm working in yours. Instead of wanting to meddle in what I do with somebody else, why don't you concentrate on the work that I'm performing in you? Don't worry about John. I'll take care of him in the way I take care of people. But Peter, you need to follow me. You need to trust me. 
because ultimately we know that John, though they tried to put him to death, didn't succeed. And we know that the Apostle Peter was martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. So his eyes were to remain on Jesus and not to question God's will for his life to the degree that he would become un unsatisfied with, with what God was presently doing in it, even at that time. Your faith is developed over time, and it's developed with experience. The Lord will give you something in Scripture, and you'll say, I trust and I believe that. But over time, that verse is going to make more sense through the greater experience you have in seeing God fulfill those verses in your life. You'll begin to learn something about how the Lord works by holding fast to his promises. And as you hold fast to his promises, then you begin to see God fulfilling his promises. And when you see those things take place, your faith expands and you begin to realize that he's good to his word. And so what the Lord is about to do is a tremendous miracle, but he has to be plain about what he's doing. So he has to say to them, Lazarus is dead. And in verse 15, and he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. In verse 16, Thomas, who is called the twin, uh, Didymus, maybe your, your scriptures that you're reading, the word Didymus, the word Didymus means the twin. So he obviously had an, an, a, a twin, a brother that looked like him. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, if I say Thomas, what's the first word that you associate with him? Doubting Thomas. Yeah, we're so kind, aren't we? <laughs> Doubting Thomas. That's a courageous statement that he just made. We'll go with him that we may die with him because he's sure that Jesus is going to die. I don't see Thomas as a doubting Thomas the way we've called him over the years. I see him as disappointed Thomas. I, I see him as a man who had difficulty, but this man here is showing me courage. And it's a courageous statement, yet it's also a faithless statement. It's even a hopeless statement. He doesn't understand what's about to happen, but he's ready to go. And he says, we'll die with him. Someone said he looked death in the face and chose Jesus rather than life. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Let him deny himself and take up the instrument of his own death, pick up his cross, and follow me. And Thomas was willing in a literal sense at that moment to go and to die with him. Now, Jesus' desire is to increase their faith, so they reluctantly follow him as he's returning. In verse 17, when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So, it says that he's been in the tomb four days. Here's your question. What is significant about four days? Why is it important enough for him to point out that he had already been in the tomb four days? Well, when you do some research on this and ask that question, you discover that some Jews believe that the soul would visit the tomb for three days, hoping to re-enter the body. On the fourth day, it would see decomposition and leave because death was irreversible. Do you know that that belief is still in Israel to this day? Last year when we were in Israel, uh, one, our, our guide was speaking about that belief that's very common amongst some of the Jews even to this day, that the soul hovers around for a while before it leaves. And that's all the way 2,000 years ago. So Jesus waits that time and then it takes time to get there. So it's a four day period so that they would know in no unmistakable terms that he had actually died. Because there are cases where people have appeared to be dead and even been buried when in fact they weren't dead. In, in the history of the United States, we have different sayings that we have, different little things we say. How many of you, I know all you can raise your hand to this one, have heard the term saved by the bell? 
you know, raise your hand, I'd like to see. Yes, I'd love to, hallelujah. But anyway, see your hands raised in church is a nice thing. Saved by the bell, you know where that came from. Some of you do, but many of you may not know where that saying, saved by the bell, came from. There was a time when people would drink their beverages out of lead cups. And when they drank their beverages out of lead cups, the lead sometimes would pollute the beverage. They would have lead poisoning. And so they drank, they would suffer with lead poisoning and go into a state of coma. There was no embalming at that time. So they would simply bury them. And the tombs that they used very often were reused. So they would let that body remain until it would, it would be, you know, disintegrate. Then they would go and take the bones. All of you have heard of the word ossuary. They would get the bones and put them in, in a container. It was called an ossuary. And then they would use that same burial place for the next relative who died. That's how it was. Well, they would open up sometimes the casket and find the hands of the dead person up their nails peeled off, and they would look at the, the, the container lid and see it was scratched, and they discovered they were burying people alive. And so because they were doing that, they began to put a bell and a string. They would put the string in the casket. They'd drill a hole, put a string in the casket near the dead person's head. And then they had somebody who would stay watch from midnight to the early morning. They called that graveyard. That's the second thing. So if he was pulling graveyard from midnight to the morning, and if that person awakened out of the coma, he would pull the string and would be saved by the bell. So that's where that comes from. It's not a boxing term. He was saved by them. No, it's literally... Somebody stayed alive because of that. So there was this belief that the soul would hover around the, the, the dead body and would not depart until three days. By the fourth day, the body begins to corrupt. So Jesus specifically remains where he's at so that four days would pass after his death so everybody would know he had specifically completely died. And you'll see this in just a moment. And so he had been, verse 17, in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. It's to the south and the east. We go through Bethany uh, when we walk down the Palm Sunday Road. So as this is taking place, verse 19, many of the Jews joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Well, verse 20, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. I believe, but I really don't. Now, Martha is the eldest sister. News of the approach of Christ comes. And so she rushes out to welcome Jesus. As we just read, Mary remains behind. But she begins to pour her heart out. Notice in verse 21, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now she knew that Jesus has the ability to heal at a distance. He had done so before. When you read your, your Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, it, it records how Jesus was in the city of Capernaum and the centurion had approached him. He had a servant he cared about. And he asked Jesus to heal him. And Jesus said, 
that he's going to come. But the man says to him, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Speak a word. My servant will be healed. I know that you have power and that distance between where you're at and what's going on. That it doesn't matter. He knew that. Even here in, 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 in John's gospel, in chapter 4, verses uh, 49 through 51, well, we, when Jesus was in the city of Cana, a nobleman from Capernaum had asked for him to come and heal his son. But instead of going to Capernaum, Jesus had healed from a distance. She knew that Jesus did that, but her grief causes her to forget what she already knew. And once again, that's what happens when you undergo grief. When you undergo grief, when you go through pain, when you go through loss, when you go through hurt, sometimes your grief can overcome your faith. Sometimes the reality of what you're seeing overcomes what you say you believe. And so this is what's taking place here. She knew Jesus had capacities, but she's kind of limited in, even in this moment when she's saying, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But she should have remembered that Jesus could heal from a distance. He could raise the dead from the distance. She should have known that. But she says it, if you'd have been here. Now, that's probably what we would call grieving resignation. It'd be another way of saying, I just wish you would have been here. I wish you'd have been able to be here. But she didn't know what Jesus was planning on doing. Isaiah 55, 8 says it like this, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. You don't know what I'm planning. You don't think like I do. But she goes on in verse 22, Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. It's been called a hope against hope statement. It's kind of a courtesy that's being extended to him. It may even be kind of a cliché. Because that's revealed by her later response when he orders the stone to be removed. Well, in verse 23, Jesus speaks to her, your, your brother will rise again. And she says, well, I know he will at the resurrection. So she thinks that Jesus at first is just com comforting her. You see, she's a believer in the resurrection. When you read the Old Testament, there aren't a whole lot of scriptures that give you insight into resurrection. There's just not a whole lot. There is some. You see promises of it, hints of a resurrection. In Job 19, verses 25 through 27, I know that my Redeemer lives. He shall stand at last on the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. In Daniel 12, verse 2, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So you have resurrection hinted at in the Old Testament. She's aware of that. And so she says, I know that he'll be raised again on the last day in the resurrection. And this is where Jesus' I am statement comes in verse 25. Can you imagine the drama of this for just a moment? Put yourself in the position where you're having this conversation. You're... you're your brother's dead, your heart is torn, your sisters remain behind, it's just you and the Lord Jesus. You're coming to him out of courtesy, you're the older, uh, older sister, you have certain responsibility. You come to him, but you love him very much, and you know that he loves you, you know that he loves Mary, you know that he loves your brother. And you're having a conversation, and your heart is broken. If you'd only been here, my, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he'll give to you. That's just a hopeless statement. It's not real. You'll see this later. And then Jesus is later in her talk, and he's discussing this with her. And I, 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 oh, I, in some ways, I wish I could have been watching this conversation because he says, your brother will rise again. Now, me, if I were watching that, I'd say, well, yeah, in the resurrection, yeah. I'd have been on Martha's side. Yeah, yeah, I know that. And that's why she says, well, in the resurrection at the last day, my theology is correct, but my experience isn't yet fully formed. So when she says, in the resurrection at the last day, and Jesus looks at her, oh, don't you wish you could hear how he said this? I'm the resurrection and the life. I wonder what that sounded like. I wonder if she heard him. Sometimes you don't hear when you're grieving. I wonder if she heard him, Martha. I am the resurrection. It's not an event. It's me. 
I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And then notice verse 26, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says, do you believe this? That's where the rubber meets the road. You know this, but do, do you believe this? The statement, I am the resurrection and the life. Again, I mentioned that John's gospel records seven specific miracles, but it also records what are called the seven I am statements of Jesus. And this I am statement here is the fifth statement that he makes. I am, he says, the resurrection and the life. He had already said, I am the bread. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the door. I'm the good shepherd. But now he says, I am the resurrection. And he's saying, listen, though your physical life may come to an end in me, you will live forever. In me, you will live forever. Pastor Chuck, my pastor, before he went to be with Jesus, quoted something that had been said by an earlier minister. I believe it was D.L. Moody who said it. And, he, and Chuck said it like this. He said, you're going to hear that Chuck Smith has died. He says, but don't believe it. Because at that moment, I'll be more alive than I've ever been. That's straight out of John. If you believe in me, you will never die. Do you believe this? Because death is final. Death is finality. There is no more of this person in front of me. Do I believe they still have life? Do I believe they're still alive? I'm looking at a dead body. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am that life. And he's saying that you'll be alive in him forever. In John 8, 51, he had said, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. You see, in anticipation of Jesus' resurrection, those of us who trust in him are alive in him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22, now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And so the question is asked in verse 26, the last portion, do you believe in this? And she answers very quickly. She says in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Yes, I do. She does, but doesn't yet understand She's basically saying, I believe and I want to believe and I will believe. And that gives her comfort. But it's not, she's not yet prepared for what's about to happen. Because remember Ephesians 3.20, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so in verse 28, when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher is coming, it's calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. Mary saw where Jesus was, saw him, and fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. These are the same words that had just been stated by her sister Martha. And therefore, in verse 33, when, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Jesus wept. He sees the weeping. He sees the pain. He sees all the people who came with her crying, and he's upset. One of the things you might want to mark in your heart is you don't have a God who is distant from you. You have one who understands you. You have one who understands 
and he actually weeped. Jesus actually was weeping with those who were in pain. He, he, he understands our hurts, and the scripture points out that he weeps with those who suffer. Isaiah tells us he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as he's there, he's basically groaning. Notice in verse 33, he groaned in the spirit and he was troubled. There's an ups he's upset. He's displaying an anger, an anger at, at what sin has done to us. Do you ever have that anger, by the way? Um, on occasion, I do. I don't, I don't have an anger like this every day, and I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. But, you know, we have a, a school right up here, uh, just up the street. We know that little school there, Newman Elementary. And I'll come driving by there on the way to the office, and the little kids, the small ones, the preschool age or maybe kindergarten, they're, they're the little ones. Turns out they're the cute ones and the good ones. When they get older, they're the monsters. But these are the cute ones. <laughs> And I'll stop at a stop sign, and, and sometimes I'll look across, and I'll see a little boy, and he'll be, they have a tricycle. They have tricycles, these kids will ride, and they have a little track, and I'll be sitting there ready to take a left to come to the church. And I'll see a little boy, and he's just wheeling and just going as fast as he can, and they're cute, they're cute. You know, I think they're so cute. And I can't help because I have my, my own children, and I have my grandchildren. I, I can't help but just just flash back for a moment about what my kids were like. You know, I remember my son, little David, uh, was about three years old, and, and we were up in, uh, up in Central Coast. Uh, we were in uh, Morro Bay, and there's a little uh, museum in that area that Marie and I and, uh, and my David and my Corinne, we went there when they were small. And uh, I took, Marie went with Corinne and was walking to the sidewalk area and I was in the parking lot, and my son David was really always energetic, always moving, so I was always keeping an eye on that kid. And, uh, and I told him, David, stand right here. Well, Daddy pulls us out of the trunk. I was pulling something out of the trunk, and he saw Mama. Mama was about 50, 60 yards away, and he decided to run to, to his Mama. I didn't see him go. But then I looked, because I was one of these dads who would keep looking, and three, four seconds, and I look, and there he is running. But there was an inclined hill that he was running in, in the inclined hill, and then it would flatten. There was a car, an older vehicle with a long hood, and when this woman was driving up, I could see from my angle that the hood was blocking her view of what was in front of her. And I still remember as I saw my baby run right in front of that car, I still remember screaming his name at the top of my lungs, David. And when I screamed, David, the woman saw me and she hit her brakes. And I remember the car, the, the, the hood, it, she hit it so hard that the hood started bouncing and David ran to his mama and I applied the Board of Education to the seat of understanding. <laughs> Could have lost my son. Well, I see these kids. And I do. I sit sometimes and I look at them and I think, I had kids, my babies were small, my grandchildren are small. And when they're small, they're such angels. But they don't always stay that way, do they? They don't always stay that way. Even our babies that we raise to be the best that we can, they break your heart sometimes. Not always. I pray that you had kids that didn't break your heart. I didn't. <laughs> Children have a way of doing that. They're in your heart, and then they break it. And you get disappointed. But how many, how many of those babies, and I think this sometimes, not in a bizarre, mean, ugly way, but I think how many of you babies are going to be addicted to drugs, are going to harm somebody? How many of you are going to live a life? Um, statistically, many are. And that's what prompts me. That's what moves me to preach the gospel, to encourage parents, raise your children up in the Lord. 
Because if you don't teach them things about Jesus, the world will teach them things about Jesus and will keep them from committing themselves. And so Jesus is weeping. Why is he weeping? He knows what he's going to do. He's going to raise them from the dead. Why is he weeping? Could it be that he sees what sin does to people? The scripture says he loved Lazarus. And even though he knows he's raising him, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus is groaning. He sees the pain that death, that death brings on people. And because Adam fell and we received his sin nature, you know, we die also. And, and because we, we have sin natures, we sometimes don't restrain it. We don't have the power to, and we aren't as good as we could be. And sometimes we're, we're, we're bad. And these are the things that, that causes a, the, our, our Messiah, our Christ to cry. It's what death does to people. It's what sin did. And he, and he has an anger and he has a sorrow, and he, and, he, and he weeps. And this is the smallest, the shortest verse in Scripture. It's something every one of us could, could memorize very easily. He simply says, Jesus wept. Two words. But when you get hold of that, it changes your life. Well, Mary had gone to him, and the crowd thought she was going to the tomb, and they began to follow. And once again... There she is at his feet, crying out the same thing Martha had said. If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And so Jesus saw her weeping, verse 33. He groaned in the spirit, was troubled. Where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And so there's this pain. There's this sorrow. And then verse 38, Jesus again groaning in himself came to the tomb. It was a cave, a stone lay against it, and he said, take away the stone. <laughs> Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, um, Lord, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that, you, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Didn't I tell you that? And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you have sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth and Jesus said to them loose him let him go hmm. didn't I say to you if you believed you would see someone said seeing is believing but Jesus said believing is seeing didn't I tell you that and notice what happens he, he prays and gives glory to his father Jesus is sent from his, his, by his Father, and he wants people to know that, and that's why he prays. He says it out loud. That's what he's saying. I, I thank you that you, you've heard me. I know that you always hear me because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. I want them to know in advance what's about to take place. You know, there are times that the Lord may prompt you for something and I haven't always responded to his promptings. Jesus knows what he's about to do, but he wants them to know in advance so that when it happens, they'll say, he told us that was going to happen, and that would have increased their faith. Many years ago, I was, uh, my wife and I took her, uh, her brother, her younger brother, we took him to a Christian concert, and, and he was a young teen at that time, and we wanted him to hear the message, we wanted him to enjoy the music. He wasn't a believer, and we love him very much and wanted him to be introduced to, to Christ and all. And we had friends. We had uh, four friends that we were going to meet at the Anaheim uh, Convention Center. And so we drove in separate vehicles. Marie and I drove, picked up her brother, brought him from Chino, and our two friends, couples, um, met us there. They were to meet us at the convention center. You've been to the convention center. It seats 8,000 plus people. It's in a circle, and there's all these doors all the way around it, right? And so we got there, 
but we hadn't made arrangements to meet these people in a certain location. And so we step in, and there's all these people. The lights are real low. There's lighting in the, uh, in the uh, surrounding area as you're about to enter in, but in the inside, it's, it's dark. They had the lights down, and they were doing their concert. And I look at Marie, and I said, we're not going to be able to find Rich and Sylvia. We're not going to be able to find them. Uh, and she says, well, I'll go around this way, and you go around that way. And I said, that'll be fine, because we would look in to see if they were waiting in a certain alcove or whatever. And so I said, that's okay. Okay, we'll do that. So I took her brother with me. And as we're walking, the Spirit of the Lord speaks to my heart and says, tell him that you are going to meet with these couples at 7 o'clock. And I thought, boy, what did I eat that provoked me to... And I thought, was that me who said that? No, it had to be me. That couldn't have been God. So I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. Because I thought, I started arguing. I started thinking, if I tell him that and it doesn't happen, God, you're going to look bad. And I'm going to be presuming on you. So I argued, no, I can't do that. I don't want to make you look bad. So we're walking. And as we're walking, I connect with Marie at a, a, an opening, a door opening. And she says, did you see them? And I walk up with her brother. And I said, no, I, I haven't seen them. And then I hear, hey, guys. And I look, and they're outside wanting us to open the door so they can come in, all four of them. And then I look at my watch, and it's 7 o'clock on the nose. And I was so mad at Marie for making me sin. No, I... <laughs> I've never forgotten that. And I turned to my brother-in-law, and I said... I'm so sorry. God told me to tell you that at 7 o'clock we were going to connect, and I didn't tell you. And I still remember him looking at me saying, oh, yeah, that's okay. He's just being kind. But if I'd have said in advance, at 7 o'clock we will connect, the Lord just told me that, what do you think it would have done? It would have awakened him to the reality that God is still alive and moving, right? Jesus did that. He said, I know what you're going to do. It isn't because I don't know. It's because they don't. And that's the reason I'm saying this out loud, so that they hear and they will believe. And that's what he's doing. So in verse 43, he cried out with a loud voice. You can almost hear him yelling, Lazarus, come forth. Some commentator said he had to say Lazarus, because he would have said, come forth, all the dead people would have been bouncing out of the tombs. <laughs> he gave glory to God and summoned Lazarus. He cried loudly so that all could hear, and then all would see. And at his word, Lazarus came forth. And at his word, Life was given to a dead man. And at his word, life is still given to dead men. Because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, when received, that gives us life. We are walking spiritually dead people. And then the gospel is given to us. And God calls your name, whatever it may be. David, come forth. Marie, come forth. Whatever your name may be. And you come out and notice something. We come back, we come to life. And then notice there's something else here I want to point. Verse 44, he who had died came out bound hand and foot with the grave clothes. So he's, he must, I don't know how, how to even picture this, whether he's bouncing or whatever, but he comes out. His face was wrapped with a cloth. And notice this, Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Um, I wonder if by practical application we can say when people come to faith in Christ, they're bound by their old life. And I wonder if it's part of what the church is intended by God to do is to loose them and let them go. In other words, to be of help with them, to be of help to them. Think about your own life. 
I have some very good people in this room. You were just good people and you got saved because you knew you needed to get saved. And then I have the rest of you <laughs> who are bound, who are bound and crippled. And you got saved. And you got saved. But you're still bound. There's still things, in other words, that need to be dealt with. And that's why I appreciate, by application, that's why I appreciate brothers and sisters in the Lord because these people unbound him. And I think, in, in, if I may, this is application. This isn't necessarily the full intent of this. I'm just making application here. But I wonder, I mean, when I came forth, even as Jesus said, David, come forth. And I came, and, and I, was, I, was, I wasn't whole yet. I wasn't complete. I mean, thank God I'm saved, but he had a work to do in my life all these years. He had things to remove, things that stumbled me, things that I was bound by, alcohol, and you name it. And those are things that had to be removed so I could walk without anything disturbing me and crippling me and holding me back. And I thank God for my friends. I thank God for, for Christians who loved me, Christians who would minister to me when I was a brand new Christian. And I mean, sometimes you may look at somebody you know who's 40 or 50 years old and you look at them and you think, well, I met them when they were 30 and I've known them for 10 years, 15 years or whatever. And you only think of them from the point you met them. But think about somebody that's brand new, born just brand new, like a parent looks at their baby. And that parent knows them the way they were as a baby and then watch them grow up. Well, for me, my friends knew who I was and what I was like and, and I was bound by sin and now I'm a newborn and I need help. And so they helped me. They helped to unwind the cloths that stumbled me in my life to encourage me so that I didn't use profanity anymore, so that I didn't, didn't use drugs anymore, so that I didn't habitually drink anymore, that I learned to treat people with kindness. All of this came through fellowship and reading the word of God and saying, God, make me like you, make me like you. I want to be unbound because I was dead and now I'm walking, but I need help. And that's what the church does. That's what we do for one another, guys. Instead of keeping them bound, help to unbind them. Instead of judging them harshly and always, always being unkind to them and saying, oh, I knew you. How about showing a little compassion, a little hope, and, and, and a little love and concern? It goes a long way. It goes a long way. Instead of saying, I knew you'd blow it. Because sometimes we do know they're going to blow it. Instead of saying that, maybe you should say, you know what? Our God is a big God, and he's able to change you. If he changed me, he will change you. Hold fast to Jesus Christ, and don't let go. You will walk the way you want to walk. You will be the person you want to be, not because I'll make you that way, but because he does. He changes people's lives. That's what the church is to do. That's what the church does. And so Jesus commands them. He says, loose him and let him go. And that's what we do. We help people so that they can go in Christ. What a powerful story, a literal story of a man who was dead who has come back to life because of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life.